Michelle Helen and Ruben, uh, Art Helen here with Art Helen Outdoors and Own Season TV. And uh, today we're at Vortex Optics with Ruben here, and we are going to go over a lot of different things with the optics and options and choices to buy and, and different things, and kind of educate you on a lot of things. And we're going to try to do it here quickly. So. With that said, Michelle, I guess, uh, you know, if you want to start out asking Ruben a few questions here and, you know, we'll all kind of chime in on different things and um, start with the optics here. Okay, we'll start with the binoculars. I guess we have them in yeah. front of us, right? So um, there's a lot to pick from, right? There is. So yeah. uh, tell me, how do you get started with picking the right binocular? Well, I think with uh, with anything within optics, there's they're they're all purpose built tools, right? So uh, they're all built for a specific use, a specific purpose, uh, and you need to determine what you're going to be using it for before you can actually go and pick one of these options off the shelf, right? There's probably seventy or eighty different binoculars that we make, but ultimately you're you're trying to boil it down to one thing. So you're looking at um, do I need a lot of magnification? Am I going to be using it in low light a lot? Um, how often am I going to be using it? Are you a twice a year user or are you going to be in the bow stand 50 or 60 days a year, right? Okay. So there's, there's a lot of different things that, that need to come into play before you can make that correct decision and, and get the right optic in your hands. Uh, but ultimately, you can look at some of the different criteria and figure out what's important to you and for the different types of use that you're going to be using it for and, and, and make that right decision, right? So uh, we would look at magnification. Uh, if you're primarily a Midwestern hunter, a Southeastern hunter, or do you go out west a lot, right? Are you going to need more magnification? Uh, are you going to, you know, is, is the ability to use the optic better in low light more important to you? So um, that being said, um, there's really a couple of different types of binoculars. We have like a, a, a compact binocular, we would have like a full size binocular, and then we would go all the way up to something like a tripod binocular. Uh, you can even go in into like uh, range finding binoculars now, right? So there's a, <clears throat> there are a lot of different things that can make it confusing, but ultimately, if you know what you're using it for, uh, what your budget is, and uh, ultimately how much you're going to be using it, you can, you can get the right optic in your hands. Okay. I see a, a couple, there's definitely a different shape. We've got, we've got this style here, right? Yep. The pearl prism, and then we've got this, these that all look similar, these are roof prisms. Yeah. Why would somebody pick a poro prism over a roof prism? Well, traditionally, if we looked at like a, a Raptor uh, or a Vanquish, they're both poro prism binoculars. Um, poro prism binoculars are typically going to be uh, at a lower price point just due to the uh, ability to have a high optical quality without having a very complex optical design. You see, we would call this kind of a traditional, like a dog leg design in the body here where you have a, a prism uh, centered here in the middle of the optic where it kind of makes this uh, L shape. Um, ultimately what that means is that as that light or that image, and we'll, we'll kind of use the, the word light in terms of the image, right? Um, as that light comes in, it's never crossing its own path. So you took two hoses and you cross them over, you're going to get all this splashing and distortion, right? Same way with light. If we were making light cross its own path, we have to have a more complex optical system to correct for some of those, um, we would call it like either constructive or destructive interference as that light crosses its own path again. Um, think of a prism as very similar to like a mirror. It's a, a lot more complex, but ultimately that image is passing through, it's being reflected over, and then it's coming into the eyepiece. So there's not a lot of complexity to a poro prism binocular. If we were uh, to go over to a roof prism binocular, this is a very traditional or a very um, popular design. Uh, right now, this is what most people are purchasing in terms of binocular design. The, the roof prism binocular has, has to have a little bit more of a complex optical system because that light does cross its own path a couple of times inside. And so we have to, uh, through coating technologies and through the design of the prism, we would actually make it so that there are there's correction, like phase correction. You might have heard of that term in, in terms of binoculars. We correct that image as it comes in, crosses its own path per se, and then comes into your eye and you can see the image. So typically if you were to look at 
uh, a roof prism binocular uh, and a poro prism binocular with the same optical quality, the poro prism will be significantly less expensive. Uh, and to say that in another way, if we had um, a, a poro prism binocular uh, and a roof prism binocular uh, at the same price, the poro prism's optical quality will be sig significantly higher. So, I guess, you know, once you've touched that, you've talked a little bit about powers and stuff earlier, too. Now, you look at them, and there's 8 power, and there's 10 power, there's 12 power, there's, you know, 32s and 42s and 50s. Yep. So, what do those numbers really mean, I guess, you know, for the people that are looking to either, do I want more light brought in? Do those make a difference in how much light gathering there really is in those numbers? And, and, you know, so kind of break those numbers down for us a little bit if you can. And is there any that's better for the Midwestern states compared to the, you know, Western states that you're looking at longer distances, things like that? Are, are, are there much difference in that? Yeah, so if we were to look at uh, those numbers in that, we'll call it an equation, we'll have typically, if, uh, let's just use an 8 by 42, for example. Uh, the first number in that equation is always going to be uh, your magnification. In a rifle scope, a uh, 3 to 9 by 40 is a 3 and a hyphen and then a 9 and an X and then a 40. That 3 separated by a hyphen with a uh, 3 and a 9 separated by a hyphen is going to be your low magnification and your high magnification. And then that, that range in between is all of the other magnifications in between that. Uh, in binoculars, it's really easy because typically they're fixed power, right? So if we looked at that 8x42 or a 10x42, uh, the 8 and the 10, are that's designating your magnification. Uh, the second number after the X in that, uh, in that designation would be your objective lens diameter, and that's laid out in millimeters. And so typically, uh, traditionally, I think people would look and say, a 12x50 binocular is more powerful, quote-unquote, right? Uh, however, it might not be right for what you're using it for. I, I can tell you that if you're a Midwestern bow hunter, it's probably not the right magnification. Even though those numbers are higher and people will see a 50 millimeter binocular is you know, better for what they're using it for, uh, you, you know, a lot of people might be surprised to know that an 8x42 actually would be a brighter optic in terms of uh, how much light is being brought into your eye. Big and is not better. Bigger is not always better. Actually, the ratio is what's important. So uh, there's a lot of marketing terms that get thrown around in the optics industry. Um, typically, we like to use terms that are um, non-brand specific. We like, we like to just use what uh, the optics industry uh, from a manufacturer's standpoint would look at it, not from necessarily a marketing standpoint. So if we were to try and determine what the brightest binocular in this range would be, we would look at the relationship from the objective lens diameter to the magnification. And we can do that by, by calculating this spec called exit pupil. And if, if you've ever heard of exit pupil, you might already know what it is. Exit pupil is when we take the objective lens diameter in millimeters and we divide it by the magnification. So if you took a real easy one is the 10s, right? I'm really good at dividing things by 10. <laughs> So if we took a 42, uh, 10 by 42, 42 divided by 10 is 4.2. That is the diameter of light that's coming through. Uh, and if you take a binocular and you hold it about a foot away from your eyes, you'll see a small circle of light in the eyepiece. If you took uh, calipers and you measured that, that's what we're getting from that 4.2 exit pupil. If you looked at a 1042 and an 842 together, um, honestly, the 1042 is a lot more popular of a binocular, uh, and I think a lot of people are looking at, well, if I need a little more magnification, that's nice. What a lot of people don't think about is that the exit pupil on an 8x42 is 5.25. The exit pupil on a 10x42 is 4.2. So you're over 25% brighter by going down to an 8 power than you are by a 10 power you can accomplish some of the same things by going up in diameter of your uh, objective lens. So if we wanted to have a 10 power binocular with very similar brightness or quote unquote light transmission 
to an 8x42, we would need to bump that objective lens up to a 50 millimeter. And what you see happening there is an 8x42, we'll just kind of go similar here, um, an 8x42 versus a 10x50, you're going to see a significant difference in the size and weight profile of the optic. The 50 millimeter objective lens is first off, just by nature, it's wider and larger, uh, but also typically you're going to see a longer optic. So the crossfire that you've got in your left hand is a little bit of a bad example because that optic typically is a little bit longer of a body, but that's more of a representation of what we would see here, right? About an inch longer, uh, bigger barrel diameter, and a little bit wider. So the trade-off uh, doesn't just stop there. One of the other things that happens is as you increase magnification, so going from 8 to 10, you're also decreasing your field of view. Field of view is typically measured in feet at 1,000 yards or feet at 100 yards. depends on um, what manufacturer it is. But it's measuring how wide that field is that you can see at that certain distance. It's also measured in degrees sometimes. Some manufacturers will just use degrees. Um, so if we looked at an 8x42 compared to a 10x42, uh, the 8x42 is brighter and has a wider field of view. The one downside though is that an 8x42 is not going to have that magnification that a 10x42 is, right? There's a 20% increase in magnification. That's a trade-off for a 25% decrease in light. Then you get into these. So yeah. when you look at this, because this is a 56, I believe. Right? Yep, that's our Kaibab 18x56. So 18 power, 56 objective lens. So some people would look at this and think that because this is such a big optic. A big, powerful optic, yes, right? That this would transmit more light than an 842. Yeah, and what you really want to be careful of, um, rearrange those. What you really want to be careful of when you're looking at some of those larger binoculars is those are a, a very purpose-built optic. That's a tripod binocular. Um, if you were holding an 18 power binocular up to your eyes, that field of view is very narrow. In regard, in relation to like an 8x42 in comparison, the field of view is significantly more narrow than it is uh, in an 8. So the 18 has a very narrow, narrow field of view when we're comparing it to other binoculars. Um, and so it's going to feel very shaky when you're holding them. So they're meant to be mounted to a tripod uh, and used uh, either from a seated or standing position where you're stable, uh, but the, the biggest thing uh, with a tripod binocular is we're looking at that exit pupil statistic again, right? And we take 56 divided by 18, our exit pupil is just over two. So it's, it's one of those things where it's very hard for me to ever recommend a tripod binocular to any Midwestern hunter. Now, you're not going to go to New Mexico or Arizona and have uh, nearly the success glassing a mountain a mile away with an 8 power as you would an 18 power. Um, and the reason why, you know, the, the initial response there might be, well, why don't we just get a spotting scope, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you look through a spotting scope for long periods of time, picking apart detail at distance, you get a lot of fatigue because one eye is being strained and the other one is not. So you get um, kind of this I know a lot of long range Western hunters that won't spend more than a couple of hours behind a spotting scope or you're going to be in pain the rest of your hunt uh, just due to kind of a, uh, like an ocular migraine type of feeling. So, um, and, and you know, when we go up, we have typically you'll see like the full size binoculars will come in like an eight by 42 and 10 by 42 and the, there's a 10 by 50 and 12 by 50. And, um, it's, it's really hard to generalize and say that all deer hunters will use this, all waterfowl hunters will use this, all western hunters use this, because ultimately there's guys within those groups that are, um, they might have better success or they might feel like they're more effective with a certain piece of kit compared to another one. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have these kind of guidelines that help you select the right optic. Um, and if you know how to calculate that um, you know the brightness of the optic or you know how to to look at field of view um, 
you know, one field of view being way wider versus one being a lot narrower. If you're, you know, able to do that, you can select the right optic. Um, one piece that goes along really well with the exit pupil talk to kind of bring it into perspective, uh, per se, is that exit pupil is um, ultimately you have that number where we can measure how much light is coming through the optic. If you don't know what that means, it doesn't really do anything for you. So in, in like daylight, your pupil will be um, kind of contracted down to three to five millimeters, right? And we kind of talked about that eight by 42 having a 5.25 exit pupil. And, um, uh, you know, 10 by 42 is 4.2. So if we looked and in low light, your pupil could be dilated as wide as seven millimeters. So what happens is when your pupil is opened up to seven millimeters and the optic you're looking through is only letting in 4.2 millimeters of light, that's where you get that feeling that we've all heard it. I picked the optic up and it looked like it was darker through it, right? So now the optic is kind of this filter that's limiting how much light is coming through the optic. So when you're looking at that image, it's significantly darker. So if I'm coaching someone on what optic to buy, that eight by 42 and 10 by 50 are really, really attractive in low light conditions where you're out on the stand, it's the last half an hour or the first half an hour of the day, there's not a lot of bright light causing your pupils to dilate to a smaller diameter um, versus out, you know, out on the plains all day, bright sunlight, glassing antelope, that's where you know the magnification is more important at that point because light is not a, at a premium. Light is everywhere. So, mm -hmm. right. so I, I guess you know if you had any other questions. I, What's your thought? Um, you know, if you look at you're talking about Western hunters and and Midwestern hunters you look at price points because there's price points through the whole thing. Is it price point specific that, you know, the less expensive is a, is a Midwest and the more expensive is out West because, or is there a reason, um, you know, is there a good optic that's good for both or, yeah. you know, how, how do they really, you know, look for that and break that down also? That's a fantastic question, Art. And honestly, <laughs> uh, a lot of times you see guys, uh, hunters, outdoorsmen, um, when, when they're using that optic more, they're willing to get into a more costly, you know, uh, a, an optic that's at a little bit higher of a price point. And typically what we will see is we do see a lot of those optics with high density glass or HD, I guess would technically be the term that we use here. Um, typically, they're looking at an HD lens element, um, which comes at a more of a premium price, right? Like for us, it's our Viper, uh, Vulture, Kaibab, and Razor HD binoculars that have those high density uh, lens elements. And it's not necessarily that the person that is going out and doing a Western hunt is gonna wanna spend more. It's typically that that hunt is a more optics intensive hunt. Uh, I can, you know, I can deer hunt in Iowa County, Wisconsin, and yeah, binoculars are important, but it's not typically a make or break thing for a rifle hunt. Whereas if I'm out picking apart landscape and terrain features, I might be looking through my optics for four or five hours a day, whereas somewhere, you know, I'm from Minnesota, but if I'm anywhere in the Midwest, I'm not looking through the binoculars for four or five hours a day. I could be using them for 20 or 30 minutes a day it's still probably the piece of equipment I use most, right? Doesn't take that long to pull a trigger. Doesn't take that long to range an animal. Um, whereas if I'm doing a hunt where it's very optics intensive, I'm going to be willing to put a little bit more money into that optic selection. The products that you will see like um, our Crossfire and Diamondback binoculars, um, they're they're very cost effective. They're, they're not at a premium price point, um, but they do perform at an extremely high level when you look at um, what you're getting for the money. Now, if I'm going to do a lot of low light 
glassing or um, like I said, picking apart detail on a hillside, that HD glass is going to really help me because what it's doing is it's giving you better res resolution. Um, it's gonna give you better performance in low light. And um, when we're looking at contrasting items, you know, a uh, buck on, it, on the side of a hill with a, you know, open background behind him, I'm not seeing any of those chromatic aberrations or color distortion when I have a contrasting object with a, a blank background. So HD glass is just that. It's higher density, which means it has a lower concentration of microscopic bubbles in the glass. And uh, those quote unquote bubbles in the glass are going to diffract light and cause color distortions. Uh, so HD glass is simply more efficient at providing you with the purest form of the image that you're looking at. Uh, it does come at a more of a premium price, however, uh, it's, you're, you're directly able to see a better image because of it. So a lot of the times, people aren't necessarily going in and saying, uh, I'm going hunting in Montana, give me the most expensive binoculars you have. People are going in and saying, I'm going on a hunt where I'm going to be looking at my binoculars or looking through my spotting scope for eight hours a day, right? And that's where you look at with how much you're using that optic, uh, you should be willing to put a little bit more into it. Just like if you were going on a hunt and you're going to be shooting at further distance, you're going to be paying more attention to the quality of the firearm that you're using, how proficient you are at longer distance with it, the quality of the ammunition, so on and so forth. So you've talked about um, kind of some of the numbers. We've talked about magnification, mm -hmm. objective, and, and exit pupil, and, and making some decisions maybe based on that and your usage. And now we've talked about um, a little about the glass, um, HD versus not, um, in the amount of time you're going to be maybe spending sure. looking through that. Um, what are some other features that um, distinguish one from the other? Because there's sure. a couple that are non HD, and then there are um, several that are HD. So what what's the difference between those? Yeah, that's that's a awesome question. One of the biggest uh, differentiators between like um, if we were to look at our Crossfire binocular versus a Diamondback binocular, the Diamondback is a magnesium chassis which is stronger by weight than polycarbonate. So we can have an optic that is virtually the same weight but it's twice as strong just due to the construction of, um, if we were looking at like the barrel construction, okay. um, not necessarily this rubber cover that yeah. goes over the optic, but if we were actually looking at what's holding uh, all the optical uh, lens elements in place, so the Diamondback is going to have a more robust chassis. Uh, if we were to go and look at um, some of the features of like the Viper HD um, compared to a Diamondback, we have a, a locking diopter, we have um, an aluminum eye cup with a rubber uh, grommet on it that'll uh, press nicely on your face. It's not, um, yeah, these, the eye cups on the Diamondback are not nearly as ergonomic when you're, when you're looking through them or when you're pressing them up against your face. Um, you also have some of the accessories that come with binoculars, like our Viper HDs come with a glass pack, bino harness, which is an added cost. Um, but ultimately, the biggest thing that's going to determine cost is going to be the quality of the elements that are, you know, the glass elements, um, the types uh, of lens coatings and the processes uh, at which those lens coatings are applied. Um, and then you have also the, um, the construction, the assembly, and the quality control during that process. So um, you have a crossfire that uh, at, the, you know, at the price point of like $150, $170 is, uh, you know, like a lot of Vortex products, we're trying to provide an incredible value for the customer um, where they're feeling like they're getting more than they're paying for, right? That's one of the things we've always tried to do at Vortex, and I think being a company that's about the customer, it helps us to always keep that in focus. Um, no pun intended. But um, when we look at that crossfire to Diamondback, you know, there's significant um, increase in optical quality and also the, the construction of the, like I said, we go to, from a polycarb to a, a magnesium chassis. You know, we go to the Viper HD from a Diamondback, we go into an HD lens element, um, locking diopter and different eye cups. 
Uh, we go from a Viper HD to a Razer. We're going to our super premium lens element, which is giving um, you know, their index match lenses, which are going to give you uh, the ultimate in, well, the least amount of chroma chromatic aberrations of any optic that we make. So there's, um, there's both material costs and then there's process costs. So we would look at that as um, those are some of the reasons why the price is more expensive. At the end of the day, why is it better? Well, it's because it has a better image. It's more durable. You know, there's, there's some uh, ergonomic benefits too. You can look at some of the more expensive binoculars and they're going to have uh, more ergonomic shape. They're also going to be, if you were to look at them and compare them, they're going to be lighter weight. They're going to be more, more durable and ultimately a kind of a lifetime purchase, I guess. But with any Vortex product, they're pretty much all lifetime purchase because of the VIP warranty. So Duh. Yeah, tell us a little bit about the warranty real quick. Then. Well, our warranty, our VIP warranty is a very important promise. That's what VIP stands for from uh, all of us here in uh, Barnabelle, Wisconsin to our customers that are ultimately purchasing and using our products. And, and that kind of guarantee warranty is that once you've chosen Vortex, we're going to stick with you. So you select us, we're going to back you up forever. Um, the warranty is uh, kind of cool because it's unconditional. There's really nothing that we don't cover. Um, the two things that we can't cover, uh, unfortunately, are theft and loss uh, and intentional damage, right? So uh, we have to have something to fix, right? That's one of the things. Um, and I can tell you that if, even if you called us and said you broke it with a hammer, um, we'll probably still replace it once to, to, to back you up. Um, but the other cool parts about the warranty is that it's, uh, it's unlimited, so it's, it's forever. There's nothing that we're going to, uh, there's no point in time where we're not going to honor that purchase and, and uh, either repair or replace at no charge, um, so for life. The final thing that I think is really cool about the warranty is it's fully transferable, and it doesn't require a registration when you purchase the product. So when you buy that product, the warranty is already activated. That's not something where you have to fill out a warranty card and send it in. Um, you don't even have to be the original owner. You could sell that product or give it to someone else, and the warranty stays with the product. You don't have to re-register uh, the product because there isn't a registration to start with. Uh, I think this is the coolest part about our warranty, and that is any interaction that you may have with us. Um, we don't want the product to break, but inevitably things happen. Um, dogs chew on it, you know, gets backed over by the truck, falls off the four-wheeler, falls out of the deer stand, things happen, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you're going to talk to a real person here, uh, one of our 300-plus employees in Barneveld here. You're going to talk to a real person. Uh, it's going to get fixed by a real person, and typically our turnaround is around two to five days. So that product is going to be back in your hands um, for you to use it. And you're going to have a great experience talking to the person that is facilitating your repair or replacement because chances are pretty good they're a, an outdoorsman or woman and they're out doing the same things that, that you guys are. So that's that's a little bit about our warranty. I um, don't want to talk too much about us, but that's uh, that's knowing that when you do purchase our product, you're backed by us. So. And we've, we've heard some um, stories that support that, you know, when yeah. we do the trade shows, you know, we, you mentioned yep. some of the, the accidents that happen. You know, yeah, had, life um, happens. I ran over, my, the farmer ran over my binoculars with the combine sure. in Elmi, and I saved up for those, and, you know, and uh, and great stories about, you know, the fast turnaround time and sure. people, you know, heading out on an out-of-state hunt and something broke just before they left, you know, those types of things. So One of the things that we don't really talk about within our warranty, but it goes with uh, the customer service aspect of Vortex, is there's, uh, there's really no definitive area of what we do or don't do. If you called us and said that you were going on a hunt tomorrow and you broke something, we're going to do our absolute best to get you an optic for that hunt or for that trip. Um, we're not going to say, hey, you're stuck with a two to five day turnaround time you know, better luck next time. Um, we're gonna get you something to use uh, in you know new or like new uh, condition, and uh, we'll worry about getting the optic back for repair when when we can. You know, we're not gonna tell you, hey, you know, we're you're kind of stuck. You know, we know you spent five thousand dollars on this elk hunt, but uh, you know we can't. You know, we're always gonna take care of the customer. Um, we've we've done 
I think some sometimes it's it's a bit crazy because it's like we'll ship an optic to somewhere out in the middle of nowhere and you know as long as the customer gets it and gets taken care of that's what's important to us at the end of the day yeah. but uh, yeah there is no like we do do this and we don't do that every time all the time well we know that life dictates things a little bit differently so we're going to try and be fair with people and, and make sure we can take care of them yeah. and true, true stories there for sure yeah. now one other um, thing that I heard you mention, I think, before we maybe wrap up on the binoculars, is you mentioned the diopter. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, whether you know it or not, typically your eyes are not exactly the same. Uh, if you have, you know, corrective lenses or something, that can mean they're a little bit closer to the same. Uh, but there's usually going to be differences in our eyes and the way we perceive an image, the way we see an image, uh, the way we look through, a, you know, an optical system. And so due to those differences in our eyes, you would have what's called a diopter adjustment. Uh, we have those in rifle scopes, you'll have it in uh, spotting scopes, or not in spotting scopes, in binoculars, you'll have it in range finders. Um, but if we look at, uh, let's just say a pair of binoculars, um, you've got two barrels that are both magnifying that image at whatever this number is, right? This is an eight by 42. Um, now, due to magnification differences in your eyes, you'll see uh, an image that most people would describe as uneven. Uh, we want you to see a flat image. We want the field of view to be nice and flat. We want it to be one circular image or oval image, depending on the optic. Um, we want you to see one image. Uh, and so where you're seeing that double image or that image that seems like um, your depth perception might be off a little bit, you can correct for that by using a, a right eye diopter on a binocular uh, and the eyepiece adjustment on a rifle scope. Typically a rifle scope is a little different because that's a diopter that's adjusting the reticle clarity, um, but they're typically both called diopters. On a binocular, what we would do is we would focus the image with just our left eye, we would close our left eye and then look through the optic with just our right eye, at which point we would adjust this right eye diopter. You see when I do this, that lens is actually shifting its physical position in the eyepiece. What that's doing is it's adding and subtracting very small amounts of magnification to that image. So if you look on here, you'll usually see a plus and a minus sign on the diopter, and you'll see a little indicator post where that image lines up. So you may have to add a slight amount of magnification, 0.25, something like that, 0.125, um, or negative that amount to bring that image into uh, complete focus into uh, a nice flat field of view with one circular, one consistent image. So that's what a diopter does in binoculars. So is that why maybe I pick up his binoculars and I don't really quite see as clearly yeah. through them? Yeah, and that's one of those things that when... Uh, when my binoculars. Yeah, I know, I know. There you go. If you get Usually a you're good at sharing, but I guess if I can't see anyways, then what good does that do? Yeah, so one of the uh, good things to do when you're selecting binoculars, um, I used to work retail uh, at a sporting goods retailer up in Minnesota, and uh, one of the most frequent things that we would see is a um, customer would pick up a low-cost pair of binoculars that uh, just by happenstance, by luck, were adjusted close to where their eyes were uh, needing it to be. They would look through the optic, see a nice flat image, and they would pick up a more expensive pair that was not adjusted for their eye and not see a nice clear, flat, uniform image, and they would be like, oh, that, it's not worth any more money, right? It's just more expensive. You're not getting anything. Um, the most important thing to do before you ever judge if it's the right optic for you is to make sure that the image is in focus and if it's a binocular or range finder um, or even rifle scope, make sure that diopter or eyepiece focus is set correctly for you. That's one of the things that's going to let you see the true differences between a $150 or a $250 binocular. Mm -hmm. That's extremely important. Yeah. All right, I think we're done with binoculars, unless you could think of anything else. No, that um, you want to share about typically lenses. no. I, I think if you if you have a lot of that kind of that in, info that we shared with you, you should be able to select the right the right binocular for you. Um, 
And at the end of the day, that's that's what we want is we want the customer to have a good experience with whatever optic. Uh, it's not all about selecting the most expensive or the most inexpensive optic, right? It's about selecting the one that's right for you, for your application, for the amount of time that you're going to be behind it, for your budget. So uh, with that, I think that's probably a good place to wrap up my nose. All right. Thanks, Ruben. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely.